Okay, good morning, folks. Um, no eggs, no tomatoes here. <laughs> All right. Uh, what we want to do here is talk to you about, you know, uh, what is happening in the meta world uh, uh, with open source software in general, okay? So, um, Tim, uh, Mike, uh, David, uh, Zach, if you could please come up here um, and grab a chair. Okay, so before we actually get started, um, if uh, you guys could just uh, present yourselves, uh, you know, what you guys do um, so that everybody knows who you are. Please go ahead, David. Thanks. I'm David Stewart. Uh, I'm an engineering manager at Intel, and I'm my, hopefully my voice will stick around all day. Uh, I am uh, a manager of our embedded Linux effort in the Open Source Technology Center, primarily working on the Yocto project. Uh, I'm Mike Anderson. I'm uh, Chief Technology Officer for the PTR Group. I've uh, been in the embedded business uh, for a little over 37 years now. My first embedded systems programming uh, assignment was an Intel 8080 back in uh, 1976. So, go back a ways. Uh, hi, my name is Tim Bird. I'm a, a senior staff software engineer at Sony Network Entertainment, and uh, I work on Linux for uh, various Sony products. Uh, I'm also involved with the uh, CD work group of the Linux Foundation. All right. I'm Zach Pfeffer, and I'm the Android lead at Lenaro and I've been working on Android since it was a thing. Um, and I've been working on embedded Linux for about, I guess, 12 years. Awesome. All right, so um, what I want to do here is before I actually lay the questions to the panel, I want to kind of go through um, about four or five slides just to actually uh, lay the groundwork as to why we're even asking this question. You know, why do we need to ask this question? And, you know, kind of have a conversation around it. And I'll tell you right away that um, the answer can't be a flat yes. I mean, there, there's no way uh, that that's happening. The question is, of course, a conversation starter. Um, so <clears throat> just to kind of give you an idea here, uh, these are some um, graphs I picked up from um, Ars Technica that ran an article in August giving you kind of the market uh, for smartphones between 2000 and 2006. As you can see, there's kind of like a spike somewhere in there for Linux, and then it kind of dies away, all right? Um, just kind of disappears out um, of the chart. And then um, somehow later on, kind of Android kind of takes off, all right? So um, of course, we're here because Android is gaining a lot of traction in the market. And this is also kind of correlated to this chart here, um, where you can see that smartphones are outselling almost everything out there that lives and breathes. And, you know, this somewhat has an impact um, on, you know, software development in general, okay? Um, the other thing that um, I picked up uh, at some point, actually uh, through um, uh, an article that um, the Linux Foundation uh, was running on Linux.com, I think. Um, so, you know, what operating systems are you, sorry, um, are you currently using, you know, as you can see, um, Android's up there uh, alongside Ubuntu, and then what are you looking for in the next 12 months? And you can see that Android is pretty high on the chart, okay? So this is what's prompting the question being asked here is, you know, where are we going with all this, all right? So the first question um, I'd like to ask the panel here um, is, you know, can you define what embedded Linux is and what is Android uh, in contrast, so to speak? Actually, the question of what embedded Linux is, I'd like to ask Tim to answer for a minute. <laughs> he, he told me that he had some other alternative. I'd like to actually, actually see if he could answer first. Okay, so. Well, you got a mic on. I got it. Yeah, go. they said my mic's not working. Oh, okay. so. oh there you go. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I, I actually don't think that Android is embedded Linux. Okay. <laughs> Perfectly fine. Well, so let me, so let me, but I have to tell you my definitions. Right? Sure, so absolutely, my definition absolutely. Is, uh, embedded to me means a uh, single function device. Well, okay. not a single function, but a fixed function device. Okay. Right? And uh, for years, at least in the consumer electronics space, uh, we've been uh, dreaming about making platforms out of our devices, particularly television sets at Sony. You know, how, how can we make application ecosystems around it and run third party apps? And, and that's all well and good. That's great stuff. And we're seeing that happening. You know, there's Google TV and, and uh, uh, all kinds of 
smart devices that allow applications to come on. But for me, that's not traditional embedded. And traditional embedded is, you know, when you bake it at the at the factory, right. that's what it does, and that's what it will do for forever, your entire life. Right. And so Android is more of a platform play, um, and I think that's kind of the big difference. Now, and what we're going to talk about, I guess, more today is: can you take a platform operating system and and use it in embedded? And uh, Easy answer right out the chute is yes, but we'll talk more about some of the details. I sure, think. absolutely. <coughs> Anybody who wants to pitch in? Yeah, I mean, okay. it, re relative to kind of my understanding of embedded Linux is, you know, kind of separate. Embedded in general, I sort of think of as different than cell phones and tablets. Sure. So, and I think that's a, a relatively well understood, you know, division. So from my standpoint, I never want to say, well, you know, Android, I mean, uh, my company, you know, does a lot with Android. I mean, we had Mark Skartman here yesterday talking sure. about all the, the investment and the tools that Intel's making on in Android. Right. But primarily the focus is on the cell phone and tablet space. And then for the rest of the embedded, you know, we've, we have focused on something different. Uh, and, and the Octo project is primarily the thing that we're trying to work with, you know, our partners like TI and Wind River and, and uh, Mentor Graphics. And I'm sure I'm missing uh, a ton of others. But generally the community, the open embedded community to try and uh, deliver that bit. Cool. Mike? I think they pretty much covered it. Yeah? <laughs> All right. Jack? So I'm going to take a contrary. And <laughs> <laughs> what a surprise. And, uh, I'm going to say that uh, Android is embedded Linux. <laughs> okay. Um, I think. So can you define the, 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 uh, the former and the latter? <laughs> well, I mean, what's an, what's an embedded system, right? It's a, it's a, I wouldn't say it's a non-upgradable, but it's a limitedly, limitedly upgradable device. Okay. It, tend to put it, pull it together, and uh, you know you don't you don't tend to upgrade the platform so much as you might upgrade you know user space or apps that run on it, and that's been going on forever in embedded in embedded Linux. So I think that Android is is a successful embed is is used successfully in the embedded Linux space because it actually is a it, it achieves those goals that more traditional embedded Linux Linuxes have striven have been striving for for a long, long time, and that's why it makes so much sense. So, I think that you know, embedded systems as a whole are just a means to an end, right? I want right. to build a thing. I need an operating system because if I don't have an operating system, even if it's an executive, still an operating system, right? Um, I, I need to make the chip work and. Uh, right. You know, embedded Linux has been a good way to do that, and now that we're entering this world where we have SOCs that are, that have in, that integrate so much technology, so many IP blocks, and these SOCs are connected in ways that we have never dreamed of before. That Android is just a, a particularly efficient way to handle that new, new paradigm, and it, it might it might even go so far as to say it's enabled that new paradigm to even exist in the first place. So um, to kind of follow up with that, um, I thought I'd get your point of view uh, here on, you know, why do you think embedded Linux uh, at the onset, you know, say 12, 12, 13 years ago, kind of started to become popular? What were the drivers there that kind of made embedded Linux the compelling thing? So, for example, the T-shirt for <coughs> the ELC later this week is, you know, have you ever used, you know, TV, blah, 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 and then thank you at the end because, you know, embedded Linux is being used everywhere. So what kind of prompted this? I, I can sum that up in one word. Sure. Royalties. Ro <laughs> That's awesome. Or lack thereof. Or lack thereof. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, well, yeah, royalties is a big deal. Uh, I, I used to, I was CTO at Lineo. Yep. Really? Yeah, which is, it's, a, it's an embedded company. You may have heard of it. It's gone now. Uh, but, uh, um, and in the early days, in like 1999, 98, somewhere in there, um, you know, when we were out there trying to sell uh, Linux in the embedded space, it was kind of hard. But the compelling things were the royalties was a big issue, and the other thing was just the availability of the source. Right. The fact that you could, that once you got that source, you did not have to talk to your supplier again. And it's not that people didn't want to talk to their supplier. <laughs> it's, it's that they often could not talk to their supplier. Right. Right. It was you know getting the time of day from whoever provided you the, the bits. You know, and especially sure. if you were a smaller shop. You know, the big companies can get, you know, support from their vendors, but the smaller companies, 
it was really hard. That's why you still see, I mean, you still see uh, in this chart, you see a lot of in-house stuff. Right. People wanting to, to see that. You know, okay. I, the other thing I would, I would say is um, <clears throat> a, a lot of people make the assumption, I think, that with embedded often means real time. Sure. I mean, I, I, a lot of people I, I know have come to me and said, oh, you know, is it real time Linux? And it's like, I think there's been a dawning re realization that you can achieve uh, the vast majority of what you want to achieve in embedded without a, a classically real time sort of oriented system. Sure. I mean, there are certain applications that will, you know, require hard real time guarantees and are, are happy to throw, a, a, you know, away latency. You know, uh, for the you know, let, you know, essentially they can they can if they get the guarantee. I'm I'm not a real time guy, so I'm going to mess up. I'm yeah, sure. mess up the definition. I've got one real time guy that works for me, and I got to be careful. <laughs> Every time I say something, he says, "No, no, no, Dave, it's this." It's like, oh yeah, yeah, right. But you know, that that's that's some of the factor that I think uh, has also helped Linux become. You know, uh, uh, you know, certainly the source code and the lack of you know the right. free end, you get the source code, but also I think there's sort of that aspect. Hey, Linux is. Is really capable in a lot of uh, situations you might otherwise have had to buy a, you know, a, a uh, you know, a real-time system for. And the other factor is I think there are companies coming along now and providing a lot of the certifications sure. that otherwise would have been, you know, whether they're safety certifications or uh, government certifications, uh, uh, health certifications, etc. All of these now are there's an ecosystem now that I think can deliver a lot of that. Cool. Yeah. Re real-time means being fast enough. Right. So as long as you can meet your deadlines, the question is how much energy and how much money do you have to put into making that happen? Right. And I used to be a VxWorks guy a long time, helped contribute a lot to the VxWorks kernel back in the day. And so when people first started talking about embedded Linux in like 98, we laughed. <laughs> yeah, happened. we know. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, over time, we started seeing some significant changes, the preempt RT patch. Right. Someday, maybe it'll actually make it totally into the kernel. Who knows? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, but it's getting smaller and smaller, so we're making progress there. And uh, one, of, one, of, one of the groups of my guys are working at NASA on the space refueling robot. Sure. And uh, we're using embedded real-time. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, we're sitting on top of Xenomai. Uh, but we're sitting there and we're running Linux. Cool. I mean, that's Very cool. uh, in orbit. So, awesome. It's 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 proven itself to be a reliable operating. Environment. Absolutely, mm -hmm. Zach. Yeah. Well, I I think all those are are valid reasons. Um, I think one reason, uh, in addition to those, is that Linux is fun. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, most most of these distributed or um, not distributed, but uh, disruptive technologies come about because you know an engineer at some company you know is looking for you know they like to do fun things right and they may have you know Linux is a hobby and they think oh well I'll pull this hobby into my work and they have a, a manager that's maybe a little more enlightened to the universe or maybe it's just cheap and <laughs> is thinking yeah sure that's that's great let's do it and so I think that you know there's there is that that element of it's just a lot more fun to work on an embedded Linux system than it is to work on like a Win Mobile system. I mean, right. you know, having put out a Win Mobile system, I can tell you. you know. <laughs> <laughs> so my next question is, given the given that you know, given those things that have attracted uh, um, uh, people to embedded Linux, what's attracting people to Android? I, you know. I'm not an Android guy, so <laughs> I will admit that. So I'm, from my perspective of why you know, I see some of that happening, I think there's an attractiveness uh, to the familiarity of the UI. Okay. I don't think it's actually because of the App Store. Sure. Because I think, in, 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 although there are some applications where I think in automotive, for example, people would love to get access to Google Maps, right? And there's some challenges there, I understand. So, but. I mean, relative to, generally speaking, how we've defined things, I think there's not as much an interest in the, at the apps and services as much as it is, well, there's a familiarity. Somebody who was saying, well, you know, if you're doing a military uh, application, you've got soldiers who are 18 to 24, and they've got, you know, they're used to the pinchy, zoomy, swirly sure. thingy thing. You know, then that's, oh, well, let's just, you know, throw that over. So I absolutely see that as an attractive element. The flip side of it, though, is, you know, it's easy, and I, you know, I'll be kind of blunt, I think it's easy to hack something together, right? And the challenge, I think, is since um, most normal humans don't get insight into what Google is going to do with Android, 
because it's not a true Absolutely. what I would Does consider. Does really get insight as to what Google's going Well, to I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure that anybody here, anybody no. here has a lot but, of insight. Well, there may be some Google people who could, I don't know. But the, the, no, they won't. Okay. So, <laughs> the, 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 you know, it's always possible within the, this Linux sort of uh, heritage that we have to, you know, it's fun. You can always hack something together. Right, and that's I think probably true of Android as well. Take the latest uh, dessert flavored uh, release, and you've got something that you can put together. But when the next one comes out, and all the middleware has changed, all of your stuff will have to get redone. Uh, you know, and what we're trying to do with the Octo Project is actually for you know I think engineers, if they go beyond saying okay, I can want to you know maybe put something together, but I want a sustaining business. If I'm going to have to redo what I'm going to you know do for the next thing and redo it again, redo it again, most engineers would rather eat the muzzle of a, of a revolver rather than actually have to do that, right? You want to actually engineer things that are repeatable, that actually are efficient. And so this is one of the driving purposes around something like the Yocto project, which has you know, portability around these layers and right. complete transparency. If we're changing a package, a package version or changing approach, everything is totally transparent. And people can comment on it. And if they don't like it, it's very easy to override through the layer architecture, any of that stuff. So I want to make a, you know, but basically that's one of the things I think is really, you can always hack something together. Right. But do you want, really want to have a career of constantly redoing that stuff with the next dessert that gets thrown at you? Sure. Yeah, but I, I think you can't underestimate the familiarity aspect of it. I mean, as somebody who's involved a lot in training, you know, it's being able to drop a new industrial piece of equipment onto a, sh onto a factory floor and have somebody walk up to it and go, oh, I know how to work this. You know, the Pinchy Zoomy thing is an important, uh, you know, UI. I mean, that, that's an important user experience piece. Right. So it's a familiarity that people just go, oh, okay, I instinctively know how this works. Let me run the Angry Birds app while I'm pressing <laughs> this, uh, you know, piece of aluminum. <laughs> cool. Well, okay, so from my perspective, uh, one of the big significant uh, effects that uh, Android has had on the embedded Linux space is that all of the silicon vendors do an Android port first. Right. Probably before they do X or Wayland or anything else, and so you see, and and there are still GPUs. Not that necessarily. Are close. Well, every silicon vendor. Not but, every. But, not keep every going. <laughs> but keep going. Keep telling me what we, you know, keep keep going. Temple. Present company accepted. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I won't, you know, we could talk about what Intel does, yeah, but we'll anyway. we'll we'll we get to that. But, uh, but there a, are a lot, lot of ports available. Of, there are a lot of ports available. There are a lot of ports, and so uh, the. What you see is you see a lot of silicon support, silicon vendor support uh, for the Android stack. Uh, particularly, a, a thorny issue is the support for the video uh, right. uh, chip uh, or IP block, whatever <laughs> it's going to be. Uh, and um, and so, a lot of uh, people using Android other than in phones is coattailing, right? Is you don't want I, if I'm developing something from scratch, I don't want to go write a video driver. Right. Uh, and, you know, it, and they eventually show up in the uh, open source community under kind of standard embedded Linux, but sometimes it takes longer, depending right. on the chip. Mm. <laughs> so the availability of the uh, support for the various silicon pieces is, well, a, yeah. is a driver I mean, there. Certainly, I mean, if you take a look at what's happened over the past few years, Android mm -hmm. has been the club that has finally gotten some of the most uncooperative Silicon Valley finally come to the table. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, but that's, that has been the club that's finally gotten gotcha. them to realize that open source is not the evil empire. Gotcha. Hmm. Zach? Microsoft is. I, I, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, think, I think transparency is fine. I think. Um, anyway, I think the most important thing, the reason why people are moving to Android, is that all that actually doesn't matter. What matters is the API level. Okay. And the apps is king. Okay. App ecosystem is the only thing that matters. Hmm. So the API is what's driving people to actually use Android then? It, there's, there, is a, there is a clear value proposition there. Okay. There is a clear ability to say, I can take and build a platform that people can monetize and people can then write apps against. And I totally disagree. There, you don't need, you do not need to know how the sausage is made to eat the sausage. Mm. And in fact, the only thing you need to know in the Android platform is what the API level is. Mm. And then you know, well, the API level isn't going to change. 
mm. or is it going to be backwards compatible? And, and if you look at how Android's put together, the API level is the contract with the user. And in fact, Google intentionally does not document how the platform's put together because they don't want people to violate the API contract. Because as soon as somebody violates the API contract, they are no longer in the ecosystem. Yeah. So, and from an application developer's perspective, they don't care how it's put together. They don't care how the video gets from A to B. They know that if they call one of the, you know, a, a, an RTP video stream interface on, on their Java, uh, on this uh, Java class that's been exposed to them, they know it's going to work. Yeah. So let me ask you a question because I'm, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, right, that depends, right? If they're, if they're doing their own hardware, then they are going to have to know the low-level bits, right? And so if you're using COTS, you know, off-the-shelf hardware, fine. You can just you stick to the uh, Android APIs. But, I mean, you've got to do some system work if, if you're building your own board and if you're trying to you know, shave, you know, sense off of the, off of the hardware designs. The, the other question I was going to raise Something was... Something I'm familiar with. Yeah, so, <laughs> right. Something I was going to say is I've, I've heard, again, not being an Android guy, but I've heard that there are plenty of tablets without... Uh, any cell connection that still have dialers, right? In there, right. right? You know, so you go. It's yeah. Well, yeah you, in Froyo, you couldn't pull the dialer out even if you didn't want it. So okay. You had to hide it somehow. Okay. So this this is it. You know. So what I've heard again, I'm not an Android guy. But what I've heard <laughs> people say is that you know the the sort of you know monolithic nature of it makes it really tough to pull stuff out. And then when you do want to you know to either save on boot time or footprint or any of those sort of things. Which is kind of a constraint. Not everybody has a you know Xeon class processor for their embedded. Although a few do. Yeah. You know, <laughs> well, which actually that. brings me to the next question, which is okay. So these are kind of like the drivers bringing people to Android. Um, what's the drawbacks of, of using Android? You know, when you're gonna choose to use Android, what are you taking with you? A uh, really big footprint. <laughs> <laughs> and if you stick to Java, I'm sorry, but the JIT is slower than native. I mean, so you're just your, um, okay, so speed, you're uh, gonna, footprint. It's speed, perform. It's a class. It's a classic, classic trade-off. You know, it's the embedded trade-off of you know, historical embedded trade-off that we've all dealt with, which is you know how much, how much time do I spend paring stuff down in order to reduce, you know, things like the amount of RAM I need or uh, right. the C, uh, horse, uh, megahertz that I need on my CPU. Uh, versus can I just take stuff off the shelf. There was a really interesting thing that happened uh, a couple of years ago. There was actually uh, the very first uh, video advertisement in a magazine that uh, what they did was they, uh, it was an Android, someone had gotten uh, a very inexpensive Android phone and stuck it, stuck the board inside the page and, yeah. And, oh, and was it a? Yeah, I remember but that. But there was yeah, a limited like, edition. It's a right? magazine. Because, yeah. Yeah. It was a. It was a magazine ad that yeah. was running video ads. Yep. And they just took Android and and it was it was a very very it was thin a cell phone yeah. cell phone that was stuck in the page and wow. they had turned off. It wasn't doing. Uh, it wasn't doing Wi-Fi or it wasn't networked, but it was doing all those page displays. But it was fifty dollars. <laughs> and uh, so it was a limited edition magazine run. There were only, you had to be getting like the first thousand issues of this magazine. Right. But uh, so that's the trade off, right? You're not going to see $5 for that if you're talking about a processor that's capable of running the whole stack. Okay. And so that's your, your cost, right? So True. I've got a, I, 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 have a, I kind of have a counterpoint to that, which is I think that if you look at the applications that embedded Linux has, has uh, has covered, right? Let's let's and let's separate out MMU lists and MMU, right? If I've got an MMU and I'm running Linux anyway, I've got a certain class of embedded system. And I'm I I think that Android fits the, all of those systems. Cuz you can get Android down into a 64 megabyte RAM if you want. To. That's okay. My my digital still cameras at Sony are at 32 meg, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So other other than all digital cameras, <laughs> what, I, what I mean, to, what I yeah, I mean that aside, I don't think that there's anything in in Android that actually precludes you from going really low. Well, I don't know. If all you had to do was sit in Kareem's presentation yesterday or Sasha's presentation later to see the seven layers of software that that uh, keep you from the hardware. 
And all that software, whether it's written in C++ or Java, takes up memory. And as we see now with ICS and later, if you don't have a high-end GPU, I'm sorry, you're not running ICS, at least not in a way that a user is going to be able to tolerate for very long. That's so, actually not, that's not completely true, though, because with a, I mean, you can do, if you really wanted to, you can do a software rendered UI on a lower resolution screen, and that becomes actually pretty, pretty viable as you have, uh, in the, as you have these more powerful SOCs that are continually coming out. Yeah, uh, you don't I, even I, need, I, I, you don't even need really, to necessarily uh, hook up to yeah. the GPU. Dr. Moore has really helped us, you know, <laughs> a lot of these things, but certain technologies don't actually moor all that well, you yeah. know. So anyway, yeah. But I mean, the original, your original question is, you know, what it, what is bad about yeah so about I mean, Android? So we mentioned the footprint. I think that's a valid point. Um, maybe I can get you guys to elaborate, say, on the uh, and we talked about the complexity of the stack. Uh, maybe about the community angle or lack thereof. Oh yeah, that that yeah. Don't get me started on the community. Well, so okay, so if you're if you're gonna there there's not currently, to my knowledge, and maybe you're you're working on this, but there's <laughs> not a community uh, effect for like headless Android. Yeah, right? it's right? difficult. You're you're riding on the coattails of Google, and you get whatever the next release of of Android that Google puts out. That's what you're gonna get. Sure. And um, and because of the nature of that, it's really hard to to create a community around it, right? Because you, one of the big aspects of working in the open source community is being able to push uh, things that you want in the future upstream, right? And the, you don't have guarantees there. Well, you don't have guarantees in the regular community either. But but it's a little bit more open. There's yeah. you got a fighting chance, um, and so. Um, I think that's a that's a big issue is okay. whether or not there's going to be a community to support. Like, suppose you wanted to do something like add Toybox uh, to a headless Android um, situation, um, right? So Google's doing Toolbox, and you know they will probably never adopt Toybox. So they may or may not, but right. but it's out there. And even if you put a whole bunch of work into it, you'd have to maintain it on the side. And so there's a whole issue. There's kind of an extra layer of development effort that would go along with building a community around Android. Okay. And I, you know, and I think here's the other thing that I sort of think about. I, I mean, I I really resist the idea of saying transparency is a who cares, particularly in this room where you know where the Linux Foundation is, you know, the whole concept is based on the premise that that a community effect, that transparency, that cooperation is the power behind Linux. Frankly, I've been in the industry long enough, not as long as Mike, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> but, because uh, my first project was the was an 8088-based one, not an 8086, oh, so that's, wow, you know, that's pretty <laughs> impressive. Uh, but you, you, you show it well, you know. Yeah, show yeah. It well. <laughs> but I would say, you know, I, you know, I've seen enough companies that people go, oh, this company's never going away. They're always going to be there. And, you know, honestly, I look at where, what's Google monetizing? Now, I don't know Google, and I, I love them. They're a great company. I got an Android phone. I love my Android phone. It's awesome. But if the, the time were ever to come where they would just say, you know, we're not interested in doing this thing anymore. You know, we're really left in a, we're kind of left holding the bag, which I think that one of the powers of the, the open source <coughs> community is one in which, you know, we are, we're able to cooperate together. And I'm not saying that this is going to, happen today or, or whenever. Who knows? Any company could decide to you know, make a change, right? You, you never know. But I think that's one of the, the things that's really interesting about a, a cooperative environment, that we can work together for that stuff. I was going to also address your question about whether chips, you know, every silicon manufacturer comes out with, with Android first. I thought I would, you know, one of the things that, that um, we try and do with our chips is we try and really make it up to a customer's choice. So if somebody wants to pick even Windows embedded? Okay, all right. <laughs> not, my, not my deal, man. But if they want to pick Android for, for any application, that's what we really want to encourage people to do. Uh, and we want to make sure it runs best on Intel. This is true of also Linux. We do a lot of upstream contribution to Linux, in all, not only with uh, Atom and Core and Xeon, all of those processors really make sure they all you know, run Linux. We're hoping best, right? So we do a lot of upstream work relative to that. But, um, so, yeah, if a customer wants to do something, you know, we're okay with it, but we sort of love the opportunity to work together with even competitors and a whole sort of ecosystem on something that really, you know, will uh, succeed. That's kind of why we're focusing and embedded on uh, the Opto project. Yeah, well, from, from my perspective with the embedded piece, when you start adding PWMs and uh, exporting I squared C and SPY 
and all the industrial controls that go along with that, now you're talking about things that, you know, have you ever tried to modify lib sensors to add a totally different sensor than what Google thought should be in a phone? That's not a trivial thing to do. And so from the does Android replace, especially headless Android, replace uh, you know, an embedded Linux environment, it's not trivial to add a totally new type of sensor to sure. Android. So you know, if you're going to try and put it in a refrigerator or a washing machine or a temperature sensor, uh, you, know, you need to be able to do barometric pressure for whatever reason. This is not an easy thing to do in Android unless you're willing to really dig into the AOSP and understand how it's all put together, which right. is why you sell your book, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's an appendix about that. <laughs> you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, so I, I, I tend to agree with, uh, with uh, David and, and in terms of this... Um, one bad thing about Android is kind of once you go Android, you're in Android. You're, you need to port libraries by and large. You need to think and design your software to use Android, which is not necessarily a platform at that point, but you're, you're, you're adopting the Android operating system, the Android object-oriented uh, operating system, which is, which is at the core of, of the Android system. And that is a fundamental change. It's, it's actually a fundamental difference in skill set. Sure. Because now I am no longer opening a POSIX pipe to talk between demons, right? I'm writing a Java service that's going to serve, you know, uh, serve um, activities that I'm also going to write. It, it's a, it, it takes that level of abstraction and is, has shifted it. And so I think... Yeah, you, what I see in when when I see what I see when companies choose to go with Android is it is it's kind of a one way a one way ticket, um, and I think companies that that do adopt Android and, and say you know we're going to to rearchitect our, our existing software to make use of the the native platform I think they reap a lot of benefits from doing that because of the way things are constructed, but, but it is a one-way trip. Sure. Okay. So, and um, kind of leapfrogging on that, so one of the things that first struck me when I kind of approached Android, I mean, I got into Android thinking, hey, this is embedded Linux, this is going to be easy, right? And as Mike said, you just get, you get the layer of cake. <laughs> um, so, I, th uh, I was wondering if I could get your opinion on the fact that Android has rewritten some major things that we've been using in the embedded Linux world for forever, right? So stuff like uh, BitBox got written by uh, rewritten as Toolbox, uh, glibc and microglibc got rewritten as Bionic, and there's quite a few other things. Um, I I have a very strong opinion on this. Okay, and, go ahead. And it's actually uh, <coughs> maybe surprising people. It's very positive. Uh, I think when I first looked at the Android stack, it was such a breath of fresh air. It was like I'm not trying to wedge Unix into the embedded space anymore. It's, it was like designed from scratch, from the ground up, with embedded issues in mind. Okay. And so, you know, the fact that it's not strictly POSIX doesn't, well, I mean, it bothers some people, but it's like, oh, you know, they've discarded some of the POSIX badges. because this doesn't need to be here anymore. You know, they did Toolbox for, for kind of dumb, well, not dumb. Huh? They did that for license reasons, right? Everybody yeah, I don't want to get to that later speed, on, but... <laughs> but uh, Right. So, but but the other stuff, like uh, what some of the stuff they did around application lifecycle, uh, you know, with intents and the message passing, is sure. is neat stuff. And like the way they handle crashes, the way they uh, the way they did the logging, um, is different than traditional Linux, and it's way better for in the embedded space. Right. Uh, and so, um, I've I've been wanting to see a lot of that stuff pulled back, and somehow put into you know non Android stacks. Um, uh, there's a lot of really good ideas in, right, in, in the Android there. stack. Mm -hmm. Somebody else? No? All right. So um, kind of going from there, um, you know, what can um, embedded Linux, so to speak, learn from Android and vice versa, in fact? You know, what can Android kind of learn from, uh, from embedded Linux? Well, I think that, that Android... You know, the reason that Android was positioned at the right place at the right time 
was because, quite frankly, in the embedded Linux space, we couldn't make our mind up as to what the UI looked like. You know, is it Qt? Is it GTK? Is it, what is it? If you can't figure out what the user experience is going to be, you're not going to be successful. You sure. can't really master it something. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and so Android was at the right place at the right time with the kind of user experience and, quite frankly, taking into account the skill sets that are available from programmers coming out of school today. You know, the universities aren't teaching people how to work in, you know, in reduced footprint environments terribly well. So as far as they're concerned, uh, CPU cycles are infinite, memory is infinite, uh, storage is infinite. They aren't? And everything has a swap. Everything has a swap, and everything runs in a VM. So Android is perfectly positioned for that kind of mindset. Uh, I, you know, it's interesting you bring up the UI thing, because that's something which you know, has been uh, kind of challenging, I think, when you think about, you know, you've got a big iOS you know, ecosystem of app developers that are not you know, using Java, right? And that's, you know, you've got the, the, the Android app ecosystem. And then, you know, there's an emerging piece that I think, I, I don't think the, the final page, I don't think we should close the patent office on that one yet. Oh, no, no. Because one of the things I think is real interesting to see is some of the developments with HTML5 yeah. as an example. And so that, that is a, a kind of a, a real potential, I think, to be very nice cross-platform sort of capability for app development, for UI development. So I wouldn't necessarily think the door is closed on that one. One of the things I think is very, that, that we've tried, you know, when you think about kids coming out of school, a lot of them are actually learning C++. So uh, QT is actually a very interesting alternative. A lot of, of kids in, uh, in other schools are coming out really involved with Linux. And so the whole GNOME, GNOME mobile area is very powerful. Um, you know, what we've tried to do in the Octave project, project is trying to uh, support all of them. And not said, okay, this is the one way you've got to do things to get the best sort of support. We've We've tried to bring the best of the community in, so you can develop, you know, applications on Yocto using Qt. You can, uh, and I got a really great C++ guy that's that's on board, you know, maintaining that stuff, right? Um, we've had, you know, people who are, uh, and, and the HTML5 thing I think is incredibly powerful as well. We're gonna have a uh, talk this week actually on some digital signage things based on HTML5, which, you know, in theory you could you could replace with a number of different OSs, but I think that that sort of captures that kind of investment that I think will be there going forward. So. I, you know, you're right. That is a powerful thing from Android that I think, you know, positioning, you know, Java from that sort of sense. It's interesting to see that, that you know, 20-year-old technology get a breath of fresh air a little bit. So we'll, well sort of see how yeah, that I mean, materializes. In, in the future of Java in general has me a bit concerned at this point. When we look at, you know, Oracle and what they're doing with Java and or not doing, you know, they've got a lot of security holes that they're not fixing. You know, is the Java ecosystem then going to transition to just what you can do on Dalvik, and Google takes the reins of that. Right. You know, where does the open source community come into play in the in the features of the language and keeping it moving forward, uh, or does Java become the next COBOL? No. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Zach, you want to take a stab at that? COBOL, maybe Fortran. Maybe Fortran. <laughs> uh, Fortran's still alive and well. Uh, <laughs> And COBOL's alive and well. Actually, I heard. Oh, that's it. horrible. I hear if you uh, are a COBOL programmer in the financial district in New York, you can oh, make a <laughs> good lot of money on ticket fees. So, what do you well, think, I uh, think, Zach? Can, uh, I think that embedded Linux. I actually think embedded Linux has nothing really technical to learn from Android, but I think it has some things, some higher level things okay. that it need that it could learn. Um, one, the first priority is that the only, the highest priority is the ecosystem. Being able, and the, not, not, you know, Linux developers and things like that, that ecosystem will survive no matter what. Sure. It's the ecosystem of app developer to user. Sure. And the second priority is how do I reduce the time to market to take widget thing in new SOC thing and connect app developer and user? If I can get that down where we're currently at with the Android space where you can pretty much turn an Android device in the time it takes to build a slide deck, <laughs> then we're ready to go. And I think the third thing is, is that existence proofs are very big. And being able to take a system that has seen a billion users 
make my little change and insert that into that ecosystem and know that I'm going to be okay, that's huge. Right. Nobody, people use Android because it, it has worked in the past and it will work in the future. And whether Google goes, goes, goes bust or whatever, I mean, that, it's kind of irrelevant. I mean, that's, that's like saying if Intel goes bust. It could like happen. I, I, I mean, it could happen. Intel? So I, <laughs> there's I, hope, I hope I'm time dead by the time it happens, by the way. My, my, my children, I hope I can get that through college. <laughs> right. You know, that's my hope. But, but, but yeah, we'll entertain that idea. You know, may but I, I mean, Android is not, Android's a, a, a particular solution to the problem of delivering a service from somebody wants to create it to somebody wants to consume it. And it's just a very effective and efficient way to do that. I, I don't think you can underestimate the paradigm shift of the App Store sure. or iTunes, whatever. I mean, try to go into a Fry's or a Best Buy today and buy software. Right. You can't. You yep. don't sell it. It, it just doesn't work. Right. So, but on, by that same token, uh, you have to understand that that has also changed the model for what people are willing to pay. For, for, those for this, apps. yeah, sure. I mean, if Microsoft decides to sell Microsoft Office on iOS, mm. they cannot charge five hundred dollars mm. for an app. Mm. Their people aren't willing to pay that. They're down in the area where they say, "Well, I'm willing to pay maybe fifteen dollars or twenty dollars." Right. So it has completely changed the monetization for how app vendors can then sell <clears> things <throat> and the prices that they can expect to get right. off of those apps. Makes sense. Makes sense. And I was wondering if I could get your um, your take on on the licensing in general. You know, so one of the things that Android did uh, was kind of like start from a clean slate, if nothing else, for licensing reasons. Um, so you know, whereas the traditional embedded Linux stack that we're used to has a lot of GPL and LGPL components, um, the Android stack is mostly based on BSD and Apache. Do you think that has we you know benefits and you know pros and cons. What are the pros and cons of, of that having ha, ha, having happened essentially? Okay, so um, it does have an effect on on how companies perceive their responsibilities relative to the open source community. Um, and I, 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 without going into specifics, I know of companies that when they make out their you know, when they go through their GPL obligations, they go through their license obligations and. And quite frankly, I don't know if anyone's ever done this, but when you, when you ship a product, uh, a modern product, there's a spreadsheet that goes along with it that has the license for all the different components. And I know Yocto's working on SPDX. And there's, but it's a, it's a thorny, big thorny issue. And currently, I know that companies, when they see the BSD license, they are, are happy about that, uh, but they also, it doesn't compel them to, to to push stuff upstream True. or to publish it, and I do worry that it ends up, uh, you know, there's a lot of good changes that are being done by companies that are not getting published because of the license, and True. so it's a it's a concern going forward. It, it's hard to say, you know, you don't know what companies are doing, and so right. you don't know how much uh, mm -hmm. how much of technology is, is getting lost, uh, and or not shared. You know, it's, it's an unknown, but it is a worry. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, Tim's right. A lot of what we're doing, the Octo Project, is trying to be, because there is so much abuse of licenses, actually, that are going on in Embedded, I think. There are a number of companies putting out devices where you can't get the uh, sources for it, the GPL, even the you know, kernel yep, bits. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So what we do, we've really been trying to do is be kind of an example setter relative to, you know, if you produce the image, you can also produce the complete source archive. You can also complete uh, have the complete... Um, you know, license manifest, so you can generate those things automatically. Um, you know, some of the, the, and I think GPL's been pretty powerful for, mm -hmm. to build the community effect. And I just think about operating systems that have been based on BSD in the past. <laughs> BSD is one of them, you know, and we see where it is now. I mean, I got my start on, you know, my first Unix was, you know, 4.2 BSD on the Vax, right? So I, you know, there was a lot that I kind of remember from that era, but it's like, you know, it's the, the multiplicative effect haven't been there. Now, the other piece of, you know, that have been worrying some people is GPL version 3, 
you know, as because of, of the changes there. I'm a you know strong uh, advocate of the, the GPL and all of its versions and flavors, but the some people have difficulty because of the anti tbization you know, factor in GPL V3. It's one of the reasons why we build a version we can either have GPL V3 or not. It's very easy to put a one line in the configuration file or a checkbox on the UI and say build with no GPL V3 sure. and that we're able to produce that that piece which comforts some people. Right? So that's you know, I think we're trying to, I think the community effect of what we're doing with the Octo project has really, you know, dealt with some of those license issues, you know, the, any concerns that people have. And I think there's a lot of success that people are having with it. Well, I, but I, I think that by that same token, you see that there are many cases, for instance, as somebody who works with customers to build new devices, right. if I want to build a new device based on, say, OMAP 4, and OMAP 4 has that Power VR graphics chip in it, and if there's any problem with a codec or something that's not playing nice with that Power VR graphics chip, I'm screwed. Yep. I can't get access to the source. I can't fix it. I have to tell the customer, sorry, your codec just isn't going to work because the guys at Power VR aren't cooperative enough to be able to give me enough information to be able to fix your problem. So I think that there is some impact of people hiding behind the BSD and the Apache license to keep you from being able to do the job you need to do. Not that they're deliberately trying to keep me from selling the product, <laughs> but... No, no, I understand. I think, I think licensing issues are kind of a red herring in the whole discussion. Okay. I think that market pressure will trump any licensing issues that people actually run up against. And if there is a economic incentive to use a GPL V3 component, it will happen because at the end of the day that you know the ability to ship product overrides those those things and in fact i'd say that that very argument is what brought linux into embedded anyway which was the economic incentive to not pay licensing fees or to be able to have access to the source was so strong that companies who would just say this is our ip we developed this right. would would forego that in, a, in, in an attempt to beat their competitors to market with, with something. And I think what we see is we see, and I'd say in five years, where you know, software, software is going in the exact wrong direction that Microsoft wants it to go. It's become everywhere. And that's, been, that's a win for the open source world, right? We may dicker about licensing and SPDX, you know, you, you can go through and do do the full analysis of, well, does this license preclude this license and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, I think companies are finding that they sell, they can make more money producing services as opposed to software. And so I think what that does is they say, well, we don't care, release the source. You know, there's, there's no IP in there. All, we, all the cool IP that we did, we squirreled that away in the chip. And so I think you see, I mean, for, for good or for ill, what, what you see with the GPL is you see essentially the GPL caused all the fun bits to go into silicon. Well, you know, just take the, the point that I think in graphics is a perfect example how that's not the case, right? And that, that's, that's a real struggle that people have had. I think actually, you know, some of the, the a, uh, AMD and, and Intel graphics chips that are finally have open source you know, drivers as examples out there um, have, have shown that a lot of times there's a laziness factor that goes into, you know, I'm design, I'm, I have this co, co uh, what do you call it, incestuous, you know, between incestuousness between the low level hard software and hardware designers and things of that sort. So there's a certain amount of uh, struggle there. The reality every one of us live with, though, is the fact that, that as you said, there are closed source graphics drivers out there that make it extremely difficult. Cool, cool. <clears throat> yeah, okay, you know, it, you're right, yeah, you're right, it's a, it's a challenge, you're right, and so they exist as a, as a, a factor, and you say if, if it's economically uh, viable, right, well, that doesn't really help the little guy, if they're the little guy or gal who's trying to make their, their living based on something, well, it's not economically viable for me to go and obviously uh, address a customer's need, so they got to go to somebody really huge, it seems like it's, that's kind of incredible. So I actually think there are strong motivations. You're right, Zach, as there's a, a strong motivation, I think, for software, um, you know, free software to really, you know, help a lot of businesses to do amazing things. It, and, and charging for software um, doesn't seem to be uh, as, as strong of an issue, although so 
being able to charge for services, for support, for a lot of those capabilities, I think, is, is pretty powerful. So. All right, cool. So if we didn't kind of address the, uh, the question of a replacement of embedded Linux, um, how about kind of having them coexist? Is there any value uh, in you know, a developer actually using a classic embedded Linux stack side by side with an Android uh, stack? Absolutely, absolutely. I've, I've done it both ways where I've had a, uh, a Linux a Cheroot running side by side with Android. I mean, the key is the kernel. As right. long as we have the kernel and the kernel is the same, then I can mix GPL uh, or LGPL libraries, squirrel it off into a subdirectory someplace, and then run Android right side by side with Linux. I've also done the other thing where I've got an Android piece on a Linux box. A Linux box boots up and does all of its hard or softish real-time things. Right. And then we use Android as the UI. Uh, you can do both, and you can counter mix. You can mix them and mangle the two of them together, if you understand the overall architecture for both of them, right. and how they overlap or don't overlap in the case, as the case may be. Yeah, I think running running Android in a VM is another option, right? That, okay. That's a, you know, since virtualization is, is is now becoming more and more of a reality with a lot of chips. I think running, you know, in fact, someone was telling me about oh, you could run, you know, their automotive system, put the you know the Android games in the back seat. You're running on a VM, but run the you know critical car systems on uh, you know on, on a Linux uh, basis. Um, there's at least one company I know of, and I may be getting the name wrong, but I'm, I'm at the risk of getting the name wrong. I think it's Open Mobile that has a product that will actually be is an uh, Android application compatibility running on Linux. And I think though I think they're doing. I really I, I don't. I'd love to give props to them. I don't really know them well enough to know, but I, I think they're probably going for market access. So, mm -hmm. like you were saying, the app ecosystem piece, which uh, I don't think is actually that relevant for most embedded applications. So, I, for, you know, so it's, I, I, it maybe uh, it maybe you just want the UI, right, and the, those those sort of things as opposed to the full the full Monty. So I, I want Angry Birds when I'm doing the laundry. Okay, got <laughs> it. Yeah. My wife. You know, yes, so, of course. You will do the laundry, so I might as well be. Might as well do, yeah. Yeah, I think one of the points with the, regarding to the uh, API is, is the access to a uh, developer uh, community of people that know that API, not so much the uh, the, well, the app itself. Well, there's also the tools, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the tools are tools. pretty good. Right, the tools are pretty good. Yeah, I like um, what they've done just recently where they've bundled everything together. One download, you get Eclipse, you get everything. You get everything. It's all nice and packaged. Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's a huge benefit over what did they do that? <laughs> <laughs> Zach, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I I I would hate for I would hate for traditional embedded Linux to go away. Okay. Because traditional embedded Linux is how we develop. I mean, it's how you know you need BusyBox. You need you need a more capable general purpose system to be able to bootstrap Android in a lot of ways. I mean, right. anybody who's tried to sit down and do kernel development in an Android platform will tell you it is not going to work. We need all of our tools. We, where's our tool? You know? <laughs> where's our, you know, and, and I mean, you know, uh, Barrow has kept the, from, from Lenaro has kept this great perf for Android, you know, patch set going for, for a while. We're trying to get that upstream. And it's just, you know, embedded Android is, is a lot, of, or embedded Linux is a lot of fun. And it, it's, and it's an extremely useful way to put together systems. Sure. And I think that as embedded, I think at the at the core of the argument is it's not an either or thing, right? And that a healthy ecosystem rises all all boats rise, right? Absolutely. You know, so I think that it behooves I think it behooves everyone to you know work close together, you know, kind of say you know, I mean we're all we're all competing and we're all cooperating and it's this great world where we live in where we're able to do that. Um, but at the end of the day, we're all running Linux. Right, right. And which gets me kind of like the last question, and we're kind of short on time here, so I'm going to ask you to make it quick, even though it's the most important question. <laughs> so do you ever see a horizon where Android would completely wipe embedded Linux out of the map, or at least the embedded Linux that we, as we know it? No. No. <laughs> no. Is that quick enough? Is <laughs> quick enough? Zach? Well, <laughs> he gets the last word. <laughs> I'm going to make this point. <laughs> One thing I, um, I kind of go back to, uh, 
people that, before the invention of the loom, right, you had artisans that would craft, craft textiles. Right. Well, the loom standardized how you created textiles. Android standardizes how you create software components. And now we're kind of entering this new world where we don't do so much software engineering as we do software manufacturing. Okay. And so I think that embedded Linux as it is today will become less and less viable as a way forward. And I, but, and I think Android has introduced that so that the traditional person sitting down, putting their platform together, packing it together, and putting a product out, I think those days are, are either gone or they're numbered. You could be for Microsoft saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that's true. That's, that's, I, if, it, that sounds like exactly something you'd, you'd hear Bill Gates say. Sorry, I, I, it's, it's a really good <laughs> like, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, from, from my perspective, I, I want to be able to still run on top of an ARM 926. You know, an L138. I want to be able to. I want to run an ARM. PC. ARM know. M3. So. You know, Cortex M3. There you go. Uh, you know, 8088. Requirement for those types. Cortex of M3 is never running Android. Then. Well, okay. That's going to be a Bill Gates quote, right? That's Sometime right. In the future. <laughs> okay, that's cool. So we're we're kind of um, very short on time here for questions, but I'd like to see if we can get uh, one or two questions. There are mics in the uh, uh, in the uh, aisles here. If you can just. Uh, Get up to the mic if you have any questions for our um, panel here. Or not. Or not. Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, there's one question? All right. I'm sorry, you're going to have to grab the mic. Do you see there is a need to define what is an Android system from hardware perspective? You know, if you are going to deliver the apps that run on any Android platform that depends on, say, BLE being there, or depending on what uh, Mike was talking about for accessories that your device should be supporting USB host. So is there, do you guys think, there is a need for defining what an Android system from hardware point of view is? I mean, we have defined it from the software API, but right. we haven't defined it what from a, from it means to be Android. From a standpoint? Well, I think the CTS pretty much describes if it doesn't run the CTS then it's not going to be Android from that perspective right but when you start talking about putting sensors out there that's always going to be that that's not a generic device that's not a generic Android device you're you're, you're tuning it for a specific application and once you start doing that then you, you you basically don't have the ability to run it on everything one last question any takers there's one over here Uh, the original Galaxy Nexus only had two binary blobs, one for the uh, graphics and one for the uh, radios. The Nexus 7 has six, and it's, it seems like an alarming trend where you have more and more and more binary blobs. I was wondering if you could comment on I, that. I'd like to comment on that. So one thing I, first, I think most people in this room owe a big debt of gratitude to uh, JBQ from Android, who by and large keeps AOSP going and enables a lot of this to actually happen. Um, Android's an interesting ecosystem even within Google. I, JBQ has always said, I hate binary blobs. And, but the SOC vendors say, well, I want to protect my IP, so we're going to ship with binary blobs. But if you look at Nexus as a platform, the goal has been to have a zero binary blob uh, build and if you look at, um, I believe it's the, which one is it? The uh, the Nexus 10. Um, I think if you look at the no, it's not the Nexus 10. But anyway, the 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 goal the goal for JBQ is to have a, a completely open open uh, device, and that's a good goal for the person that is releasing all all of the software and, and is a real driving goal or force behind that. So yeah, I think, I think it's a it's it's like, it, it's just Google is having to deal with how the SOC manufacturers want to deliver their 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 enablement. All right, well, thank you very much, folks. Thank you guys, and enjoy the day. <laughs> <laughs>